Ahatsa eager, panting after the water brooks of your comfort. And so, Lord, we are praying that as the children are not disappointed when they are being looked to, or when they look upon their fathers, we are praying that nobody will be disappointed tonight. Amen. Open your hands and satisfy every hungry heart. Amen. Make every thirsty soul to be satisfied tonight. Amen. Heal the sick. Amen. Restore backsliders. Amen. Accept those who are coming to you for the first time. Amen. Sanctify believers. Amen. And make your presence and your power to fill those who are thirsty after you. Amen. Thank you, Lord, because we know you are here. And that your abundance will satisfy us. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Genesis chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tend Abraham and said unto him Abraham and he said behold here I am and he said take now thy son thine only son Isaac whom thou lovest and get thee into the mount of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. We are continuing our study in the life of Abraham. There are many similarities between the way Abraham came to the Lord and the way many of us I have, have come to the Lord. And there are many similarities between the relationship of Abraham and God and also our relationship with God. And that is why the life of Abraham is so important to us. If Abraham worshipped the same God we are worshipping, if Abraham walked with the same God we are walking with, if Abraham dealt with the same God we are dealing with, and if the grace of God was sufficient unto Abraham and we are worshipping the same God, then we know that what God asked of Abraham, he will ask of us. We know that the grace that kept Abraham true unto God is able also to keep us true. If Abraham did not fail God in all that God asked from Abraham, we know that the Lord is able also to keep us obedient unto him. If Abraham felt the way we feel today, saying that we are dust and ashes, that in ourselves we have no strength of our own, but that our sufficiency is found only in God. If Abraham felt that way, that without God he could do nothing, and yet he was able to do all that we find recorded in the Bible he did, so also we know that his sufficiency is able to make us do what we ought to do. And that is why the study of the life of Abraham is so important to every child of God, to every believer. Right from the time we knew about Abraham in the Bible, from Genesis chapter 12, reading there from verse 1, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Verse 4. So Abraham departed as the Lord has spoken unto him. The very first time God dealt with Abraham, Abraham heard the voice of God. 
And God told Abraham the preaching of repentance. It is true that Paul later said in Romans chapter 4 that Abraham believed God and it was counted for him as righteousness. And he also said that we see that Abraham was not justified by works, for he had been saved by faith or through faith before the right of circumcision was ever given unto him. It is true that Abraham believed on the Lord and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He was justified not by circumcision, yet he was justified by the obedience of faith. Because faith is not a passive thing, faith is always connected with the obedience to the word of God. The Lord spoke the word to Abraham saying, get out of your country to a land I will show you. He had never seen the land flowing with milk and honey. And yet Abraham departed, went out of sin into the land God was going to show him. He had never seen anybody that went to the land, but he believed God, that God wasn't telling a lie. And he left what he could see and went after what he could not see. He did not walk by sight. He walked by faith. He removed his eyes from what he could see and he looked upon things he could not see. And when the Lord promised him that he'll make his seed to become like stars of heaven, when as yet he had no child. He followed God by faith, not walking by sight. And in Genesis chapter 13, verse 8 and verse 9, And Abraham said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, between me, between my headmen and thy headmen, for we be brethren. It's not the whole land before thee. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will take to the right hand. And if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Now, in our little understanding of the scriptures, we think that hearing God's word, of repentance, of separating from anything that will make us to be less than our best for God. We think it is only when we are seeking to be saved, when we want to be accepted by the Lord. At that time, we are making right our ways and we are repenting and giving up anything that will hinder our getting to the Lord. But no. Every day of our lives, we keep hearing God speaking to us. Every day of your life, if you stand true to the end, you will see things you have to separate from. You will see things you have to lose to keep eternal life. And so Abraham, after he had been justified, after he had come to the Lord, after he had heeded the call of God, saw a thing that was going to hinder his onward journey and he separated himself and later God still kept speaking to him. After you are saved, you will still hear the voice of God through the word of God telling you to forsake one sin or the other. Many of us make the mistake when we say, but I have been saved and I don't need to repent anymore. You have been saved unto obedience. You are not saved unto disobedience. You are saved unto absolute surrender. You are not saved into rebellion against God's word. You are saved unto hearing God's voice. You are not saved unto no more hearing God's voice. You are saved unto bringing yourself under the dominion and obedience of the word of God. You are not saved unto selfishness 
unto now walking by your own opinions and ideas, you are saved unto obedience. And therefore, all through your life, you will hear God speaking to you every day. And any day that goes without you hearing God's word clearly, directly speaking to you, is a day that is lost in the calendar of your Christian life. Any day you spend without hearing God's voice, God's word speaking to you to leave that, to deny yourself of that, to come into obedience, to walk closer unto the Lord, to do a definite thing in your Christian life. Any day that is spent not hearing God like that is a day that is lost in the calendar of your Christian experience. And so we find that Abraham kept on hearing God's voice and listening to God and obeying God all the time until we come through to chapter 21. Verse 12. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, and because of thy bondwoman, in all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Verse 14, And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and took bread and a bottle of water, and gave it unto Hagar, putting it upon her shoulder, and the child, and sent her away. And she departed, and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Now, Abraham was still listening to the voice of God. But Abraham all, almost made a mistake in that Abraham had been seeing God and had been listening to God's audible voice. Abraham was used to talking to God like a friend will talk to a friend. And Abraham will keep on conversing with God. When Abraham finished talking with God, then God will go away. Audibly, he will hear the voice of God. But he almost came to the point of thinking that he would only hear the voice of God through a revelation, through an audible voice, through a direct contact with God. God spoke to him through a woman, saying, cast off that second woman. You know, Abraham, that whenever God spoke, Abraham would rise so very early in the morning and would obey God. But at this time, he felt he was only being talked to by a human being. How many times you have felt like that? When you were saved, you heard God. You were convinced by God, convicted by God. The Spirit of God spoke to you directly, and you are very sure. Nobody could confuse, confuse you about a particular item in your repentance. You went about making right your ways. Why? You have been talked to by God. It was definite. But later, you felt that except God spoke through a revelation or through a direct contact, you wouldn't obey like Abraham almost fell into that mistake. And a woman spoke and said, cast out the woman. And Abraham felt, no, I will not obey this one as quickly. I will obey the voice of God. And then God came and said, Abraham, I can speak through very many ways. Sometimes I speak through a, a small person a little child for a little child shall lead them. Sometimes I speak through the voice of a servant at home. That is my way at that time. At another time, I speak through your wife. That is still my voice. At another time, I may speak through Abimelech, an unbeliever, still telling you this is my will. You almost forgot that. And therefore, 
rise up and do as your wife has told you. For that is my word unto you. And Abraham rose up again very early and obeyed the voice of God. And he needed to cast off the woman. This wasn't the day Abraham was saved. Abraham had been saved in Genesis chapter 12 when he obeyed God in faith and came out. This is chapter 21. God was still speaking. You were saved perhaps years ago, but are you still hearing God today? Or is God's voice and word fresher with your converts than with you? Or is yours a, a history? I used to hear God speaking to me, but now that I've come to maturity and I am okay, I don't hear anything anymore. I just go to a Bible study and it speaks to other people there. And I see it speaks to James and to John and to Mike and to Mary. Uh, and it told me that it spoke to so so and so who didn't come. How about you? Well, you just enjoyed it. Nowadays, it is coming to enjoy the Bible study. It doesn't pay you anymore like fire burning in your bones. Like hot water, very hot in your belly. Or like hammer striking you on the head, driving the nail home, driving the point home to convict you. Now you are only um, an overseer over the word of God. Yes, it was all right. It was sound doctrine. You are now a judge of the word and no more a doer of the word. Not Abraham. Every day of Abraham's life with God, he was hearing God speaking to him. And so we should always be listening to God and he will always keep speaking unto us. Now in chapter 22 where we have read, God came and spoke to Abraham. Verse 1. And it came to pass after these things after he had obeyed God and had driven away Hagar and the other child that he had, Ishmael, that God said in verse 2, Take now thine only son Isaac. Now the first child had been driven away. The only child that remained now was Isaac. So even if God said, Take your son, and did not mention the son, he would take Isaac because the other one had been driven away and had got married over in Egypt. And therefore, Abraham had no more contact now with Ishmael. But God came and said, Take thy son, thine only son that remains with you now, Isaac. But in verse 1, you'll see that the language is used, that God did tempt Abraham. Now, the word there, tempt, uh, can be rendered test or try. Now, those three words uh, meant the same thing as applied to Abraham in Old English, that God tempted or tried or tested Abraham. It doesn't mean to tempt to commit sin because here it wasn't that God brought a sin and God said, now Abraham commits sin. Was it like that? No. no. So the way we use temptation and tempt is when the devil brings a sin and says, now commit sin. We say, we are being tempted. But in this case, God wasn't bringing a sin to Abraham, then telling Abraham, tempting Abraham to commit sin. This was a trial of faith. This was a testing of obedience. This was tempting or trying or testing his obedience in the Lord. Not tempting the way we normally say it today. And we would all be te tested and tried like that. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 17. 1 Chronicles 29, 17. Wow. 
I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart. I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart. God tries the heart. He tests the worth and the value and the obedience of your heart. Psalm 7 verse 9. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end and establish the just. For the righteous God tries the hearts and reigns. God tries the heart. It's repeated over there again. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 3. The refining pot is for silver, and the furnace is for gold. But the Lord tries the hearts. Now, the picture there is that the blacksmith takes iron and puts it in the fire. The goldsmith takes gold and puts gold in the refining pot on the fire. But God does not try gold and silver and iron, but God tries the heart. That as the goldsmith takes gold and melts gold, and then when it is melted and tested by, by fire, it's now beaten or molded into shape. Like the blacksmith takes iron, puts it in the fire, and the fire burns up anything that is refuse or bad and then when it is red hot it can easily be beaten into shape what the goldsmith what the blacksmith does with the gold and the um, iron respectively god takes the heart and passes it through testing time to know what what the heart is of now first thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4 But as we are allowed of God to, to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, and not as pleasing men, but God, which tries our hearts. And so all over the scriptures, you will find that God tries the heart. Daniel chapter 12, verse 10. Many shall be purified, made white, and tried. Many shall be purified, made white, and tried. And these are the people, after they have passed God's test, after they have gone through the testing and the trying of the Lord, and they have been found faithful, found loving unto God, fearing God, then they'll be brought through to where God puts the people that are purified, made white, and tried. And therefore you see that being tested or being tried was not only peculiar unto Abraham, it also happens unto us. Well, perhaps you are wondering whether you can ever be tried where we tell you that you have often been tested by God. But very many times you have failed God's testing because you didn't know that God was testing you. Because God didn't announce to Abraham saying, I am testing you like our teachers tell us beforehand. Two weeks to come, you are going to have a test. They announce it. Or like excellent examiners do, they tell us six months before the time and they give us the date of our test. And therefore you prepare to pass the test. But God never tells you that he's trying you. He doesn't tell you that he's trying your patience. When as a driver, you are on a long queue and you feel tempted to go one way and 
to pass all the others. God was trying your patience. And when you went through, then later God came and said, where is the patience? You have been tried already. Or sometimes when you get to the post office and you are in a hurry, and the fruit of the Spirit is patience. Oh, I have it. I've been born again. I am patient. <laughs> but the testing field is there. You get to the post office. It's too long. And then you go to a friend there and give him money. Please help me buy it. Stand. I'll be waiting here for you. You have been tested. But you know whether you have failed or you have passed. Or sometimes when you are praying for something, and you have prayed and prayed and prayed, God was going to answer. But God wanted to know whether the flesh still remains with its methods in you. And then you are looking at the condition. Then you go to your husband and then you weep before him. After you have wept, your weeping makes the husband to do it. Your prayer is set aside. God has found out. He has tested your patience. He has tested your faith in prayer. And he knows that whenever you pray, you cannot wait for the answer. You have been tried already. And you know whether you have failed or you have passed. For passing another chance. Not that other chance. You've lost that one. And so we find that very many times when we have prayed for something, you are seeking for joy. Now God isn't going to announce that, well, I still answer prayers, but I'm only testing whether you depend upon the arm of flesh or you, pe you depend on the living God. You say, well, you have taken the exam, the qualifying exam, you have passed, you will be chosen. And you find others going through, they have been employed, and they say, we'll still write you. And the Lord has reserved it for you. You have prayed in faith. Then you have asked the person, help me look whether I was chosen or not. He went to look and he came to tell you, you have been chosen. Why wasn't I written then? You know these people. And then you went back. What will I do now? Okay, it's not bribery. Since I've taken the exam, they have even taken me and waiting for the result. And then you went to the boss and you gave something. Not bribe, but just a um, you have been tried and you know whether you have passed or you have failed. God isn't going to announce that I am testing you. It may be one problem or the other. You can't understand or you have lost something. God wants to know whether you love that thing more than God. This thing is precious. You are saying, well, I don't love anything in the world at all. I love God with all my heart, all my soul, all my spirit. God says, I agree. And then you lost a wristwatch. Really, you left it in the bathroom, but you didn't know. And then you lost it, you couldn't know. Maybe it was in the classroom, maybe it was this, it was that. You went on about, and then you went into your room, you were crying. And God came and said, why are you crying? What is it, this, sister? That wristwatch is so precious to me, it's this and that. And then later God says, infants, weeping infant for his word, look at it in the bathroom. Hey, God is so good about our failed the test. <laughs> and so we feel that when God is going to try, is going to test us, he's going to come in such a big way. No, my testings are different from your testings. You might pass yours. You might fail yours. God tries everybody. Everybody's heart, everybody's obedience, everybody's patience, whether you depend upon God or depend upon people. Now let us see in First Samuel chapter 13. We are reading from verse 8. And it tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. First Samuel chapter 13 verse 8, we've read verse 9 now. And Saul said, bring either a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. 
and he offered the bond offering. And it came to pass that as soon as they had made an end of offering the bond offering, behold, Samuel came. He had waited for Samuel seven days, for Samuel to come and offer the sacrifice before going to battle. And who will say he wasn't patient enough? Samuel had said, in seven days' time, I will come. Now, the people were not going to battle until they had sacrificed. And therefore, he was waiting patiently for Samuel to come. This was the Samuel that had anointed him king over Israel. And it belonged to the, uh, to the office of the prophet and the priest to offer the burnt offering. It was not the duty of a king. Because in God's kingdom, you stand in your rank. You stand in your position. The king doesn't do and never does and never should do what the priest ought to do. The prophet never does what a judge ought to do. And in the Christian fold also, it is the same thing. When the Lord gives you a duty, he limits it. Go thus far, but no more. The other part is left for this fellow, for that brother, for that sister to do. And God is not the author of confusion. And when God doesn't tell you to do a thing, it might be impatience or pride. I can do it too. You can do it too. And so Saul saw that the people were scattering. And as they were scattering, he said, what will I do now? He said, give me the offering. I'll do it my at least I've waited for seven days. Who will say I have not tried? In man's standard, he tried. With God's standard, you'll see the conclusion. As soon as he made an end of offering, that's still seventh day, Samuel came. Then verse 11, and Samuel said, what hast thou done? Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me, they, they no longer supported me. They felt that I was being too patient. They felt that this was no more Christianity, it, it was being dense. It was being sluggish. It was not a uh, caring for myself. Don't you even help those who help themselves? And they felt that if I wasn't going to take Afro, they were all Jews, and we are all Jews. And when they told me all that and they were catching away, um, let's see in his own language, verse 11. Saul said, Because I saw that the people scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed. And the Philistines gathered themselves together at uh, Mithmash. Therefore, I said, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself therefore. I forced myself. When I saw the situation, when I saw the circumstances, when I saw that people were going away from me, because I was waiting to do only what God has said, when I felt that I was abiding by right, strong, um, sound doctrine, and by my obedience to everything that God said, I was too slow for people. I was too sluggish for them. I wasn't quick uh, enough for them. And I saw that it wasn't um, going my way. It wasn't helping me at all. They were going away. I felt, well, I must be wise. I must do something. Therefore, I forced myself to do it. And I offered a burnt offering. Verse 13. And Samuel said unto Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, not the commandment of Samuel, which he commanded thee. For now he would have the Lord, for now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. Saul didn't know it was testing time at all. He didn't know that that little thing, to wait, just wait for me there. He didn't know that God would use that as a test of God said, I want to give this man an everlasting kingdom, but I must try him. I can't bring him onto promotion. I can't bring him to a wonderful privilege and position without first testing him. What test would I give him? The test was not anything too difficult for anybody to pass. It was only patience, wait. And sister, you know that the Lord told you to wait. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. 
you waited, now you are 26. She is 23, she has got married. She is 24, she has got married. Uh, your junior sister has now got two children, and you've been waiting. And you have found that other Christians are even telling you that, well, they feel that it's no more Christianity. They feel that it's only that you are unnecessarily strict. And now you are forcing yourself to do what you wouldn't do in the past. God didn't tell you he was testing you, but you have been tested. Or the same thing with you, brother, where everybody they will come to you and introduce this is, this is, this is, and you feel that I'm being left out. I was waiting, I thought that it was God who will do it. Yes, it's not a message, it's God who will do it. These others have done there. What am I waiting for? You are waiting for God's time, for God's will, and for God's choice. But they have all gone ahead. Yes, they will be marking time there. Just uh, marching, but not progressing. When they come at a wall that the Lord has built in front of their progress, when the Lord will open a door before the patient that no devil can shut. But brother or uncle is no more with you. Oh, in 1974, when I was on fire for God, I was foolish. I carried it too far. I will wait, 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 and wait, except the Lord clearly says, go, I will not go. But now, I know why, sir. When I look at the thing and I know it is not simply wrong, I go ahead. If it is wrong, God will correct me later. But you know you have changed your methods, you have failed. And so, Saul didn't know that God was testing. That this test of patience just to wait upon the Lord without murmuring, without complaining, without talking at all, without regretting, what have I done now? Or they are just going away from me. I stayed by sound doctrine, they were departing from me. I stayed by everything, the word of God according to the New Testament standard, they were going away from me. What must I do now? They report to himself. And Samuel said, the kingdom is not taken away. Verse 14. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. He failed the text. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. Just this short period that uh, Saul had failed in the test, the Lord had uh, now been seeking for another person to take the place that um, Saul had failed to keep. The Lord had sought a man after his own heart who had been waiting patiently upon him. And the Lord has commanded him to be captain over his people because thou hast not kept the, law, uh, the word of the Lord that he commanded thee. And so, we are seeing that we are all tried, we are all tested. But because the Lord does not announce it, when we are being tested, many of us don't look at it as that we are being tested. We just feel that it's, um, you know, just a common thing. You are talking, 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 and the Lord reminded you, in the multitude of words, they are wanted not sin. Therefore, he that is wise will keep quiet at such a time like this. You went on and fired on because you could talk. You are no much in the past. You used to be shy. But nowadays, I am bold. You are bold. But you have failed the test. The Spirit of God controls the man. Because temperance or self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. Are you failing your test? When you are passing your test. Not great things, the small, small things like Saul did, and he failed the test. Now, the test that came to Abraham, Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Who wants to stop there whom thou lovest? God knows what you love. You might say, I love God more than all things. He understands the language of your heart. You cannot deceive God. You cannot tell God what is not true. And even when you tell God a sin, God is going to test and is going to try it to see whether it is so or not. And here, God said, Abraham, take your son, Isaac, 
whom you love. It was natural and it was scriptural. It wasn't wrong for Abraham to love Isaac. He had waited for the birth of Isaac for 25 years. God promised Abraham, I will give you a seed and through you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. At the age of 75, when he came out of his land, and God gave him and fulfilled that promise when Abraham was 100 years of age. He ought to love the child. And now God demanded that Abraham ought to love him more than Isaac. John chapter 21, Gospel according to St. John, chapter 21, Verse 15. Gospel according to St. John chapter 21, verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? The drops of fishes were there. The nets were there, and Jesus looked at the fish, great in size and great in number, and said, Simon Peter, you promised me you will die with me. You promised if all else forsake you, I will not forsake you. You promised whatever it will cost, I will go with you. But your language was, let's read John chapter 21, verse 3. Simon Peter said unto them, I go a fishing. And he said unto me, We also will go with thee. <laughs> After Jesus rose from the dead and told them, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. And then he went away during the week when they should have been thinking about that. Peter, who wanted to die with the Lord. Peter, who wanted to do everything you could possibly think of. Told John and the others and said, Brethren, there's no use staying idle. I go a fishing. We made the next two or so three years ago. You want it again? Not that I want to take it already. We do also. And no satisfaction. All through the night, you might go back to dancing. But all the same, you will see that there is no joy in it. You can go back to drinking and smoking. But you will find that you will soon catch the smoker's call. Even when others don't catch, you will catch quicker than they do. And because the Lord makes life hard for the backslider. The Lord said, the way of the transgressor is hard. And so all through the night they thought nothing. And then Jesus came and said, children, have ye any meat? They said, no. How can a backslider have meat? To feed himself and to feed friends and family. And he said, cast there. And they cast there and they caught. 153 in number. Before they came, the Lord had put for them and said, Come and dine. They dined. And then Jesus said, Peter, I know you love me. You will die for me, wouldn't you? You will give up everything for me. You will give up wife and children. You will give up land and houses. Everything. But this is the old merit that you dropped when I was with you. Peter, this it. Taste the fact. Lovest thou me more than this? And Peter said, Lord, you know his temptation. I love you. And so God said, Abraham, that child you love. God knows what you love. The old merit. Or the old comrades. Or the fishes you still have. Or it is a building project. Or it is houses. Or it is money. He knows to love over time. You can't deceive God. He knows to love money. He knows to love abundance. He knows that to love possession. 
He knows that you love to satisfy the flesh. He knows what you love. And even when he's asking you, lovest thou me, man, more than this, he's only waiting for an answer, whether you will tell another lie at the top of it, saying, Lord, I love you. And he will test it, whether you love him or not. And so, since you love him, he's asking, give it to me. Take your only son that you love very much and give this son unto me. Now we see the obedience of Abraham. Chapter 22 of Genesis. From verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, um, and he clave the wood for the bond offering, and rose up and went unto the place which God had told him. That was fanaticism, if there was anything called that. Without telling the wife at home, without asking after seeing the plain word of God, hearing the plain word of God, without waiting to see if God will change his mind, wouldn't you sincerely? When you have been uh, waiting for this thing for 25 years, you have been with this man from primary school, from primary four. You have been coming along with him. And now God said, I know you love me, you want to be a wonderful Christian, a preacher, an evangelist, you want to take strong goals for the Lord, you want to preach the gospel, that millions will be converted, yes, but you must love me, you are going to work for me. You can't work for a person and not love him. Is that possible? And so God says, what you have been going along with for 25 years, give it up for my sake. Ah, God, I love you. But I will pray to see whether you are really talking or it's another voice. You are waiting to see God will change his mind. God is not man. He is testing your obedience and he has known of what type of person you are. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took the child and took wood and took a knife. He didn't forget anything that he should take along. He could have in sorrow forgotten the nine. He could have in sorrow forgotten the matches. He could have in sorrow been praying and weeping and fasting and seeing whether God really demanded the same God, I will give everything up. I will give up every other thing. But God if you will just spare this child, if you can take me away, because this child is now there, and it will make you to fulfill your promise, out of this Isaac shall all nations be blessed. Take me away and let Isaac remain. And I, God said no. Others during their testing time will say, I prefer to die. Well, cowards want to die when they have problems. But for religious people like Joshua will want God to lengthen the day and tell the sun to stand still there for the day to be longer. Cowards want the days to be shorter. But for religious people who are willing to follow God all the way through, whatever it takes, let the day be longer. Joshua wasn't a coward. And also Abraham wasn't a coward. He took the child and went along. There you are seeing the obedience of Abraham. When he got near the place, he said, Now you two servants, wait here. I and this lad will go yonder and worship. He said, I and this lad will go yonder and worship. Verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young, unto his young men, Abide ye here with the earth, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. That is the meaning of worship. When you sacrifice your best for God. When you obey the Lord on your knees. When you are giving up everything God wants you to give up, that is worship. You know, in our mistake, we think that singing choruses and sweating is worship. We think that singing specials is worship. 
We say that when we read the creed and the catechism, we say we've gone to worship. When they read the lesson and we hear a wonderful sermon, we have gone for worship. But real worship is when God says, that thing in your life, give it up for me, for my sake, for the gospel's sake. And you give it up, that is worship. And those who have never given up, all that God wants them to give up and they sing crosses and pray wonderful prayers and shout revival, hallelujahs, they are not worshiping, they are making noise. I and this lad will go and as I'm sacrificing the child, I'm worshiping God. If you will know what it means to worship God in spirit and in truth. As the sinner is repenting, giving up sin is worshiping God. As the believer is consecrating himself to be purified, to be made holy, to be sanctified, is worshiping God. And you are as you are seeking the Lord, saying, Lord, whatever it takes, I want your best for my life. I want the old Pentecostal experience to come upon me in new measure, in the baptismal measure, you are worshiping God. As you are saying, Lord, whatever it takes to win souls and to give up anything or to reach out to multitudes, you are worshiping God. As I say, Lord, anything that will disturb me from making the rapture, I give it up just to make sure that I get in because I know that many shall seek to enter in for the shall, but they shall not be able to because it is difficult for the man that is still holding to the things of the world to get into the kingdom of God as it is difficult for the uh, camel to get through the eye of the needle. And therefore, I'll give up everything that will disturb my getting into the narrow gate. It is only then you are worshipping God. But all our singing, wonderful songs, our clapping, all our praying, every other thing we do without giving up ourselves as a living sacrifice unto God is not part of true worship. It is only when you join it with truthful, absolute surrender and yieldedness unto God that you are truly worshipping God. I want to talk a little on the trial of Isaac. You never hear about that. The trial and the test of Isaac's love, of Isaac's obedience, of Isaac's faith. Now, Abraham must have told Isaac how the Lord will bring multitudes of nations and bless nations through Isaac. How could Isaac understand that God required his so loving father to kill him? How could Isaac understand that he was no more uh, the son of Abraham now, that he was the lamb for the sacrifice? Father, why is the lamb for sacrifice? And Abraham said, the Lord will provide when we get there. When they got there, he took the child. The Lord has provided you, not for me, but for himself. And that I'm not going to hold you because you are dearer, you are wanted by God. If God wants you, who am I to keep you? God will provide the lamb for a sacrifice. And I will sacrifice everything in my life, everything in my possession for the good and for everything that God wants. And God has provided you. Remember, Abraham was old, now far above 100 years. Remember that this was a boy who could carry wood. Now, when we say wood, that could make an altar. It is not just a three straight sticks or four sticks. A punch or a bundle of wood that could be carried, that could not just carry or take him by the hand, but really carry by the servants before. Isaac was old enough to be able to carry that now. And then Abraham, feeble, old Abraham now, now taking Isaac, and Isaac not quarreling, Isaac not shouting, not saying anything whatsoever, quietly waiting to be found by the father, and then to lay on the wood, and to take the knife for Isaac not to shout, not to cry, not to talk. Well, you know that it was also a test of Isaac's obedience, Isaac's love for God. Isaac knowing that my father always obeys God. Whatever God says, even though it works to my ruin, whatever God says, even though it works for my destruction, he is God. His word must be obeyed. 
whatever it costs, sell, or the flesh, that indeed is following after the Lord. I seek. I seek. But how about me? How about you? And we see that he became like Jesus Christ and in Isaiah chapter 53. Verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. The thoughts that would be raging in his heart at that time. Didn't my father tell me that uh, through me all the nations of the earth shall be blessed? Didn't my father tell me that they have been waiting for my birth for 25 years? Didn't my father tell me that it is through me that God will fulfill his promise to my father? How can I understand this now? God, I don't try to understand. I only try to obey. And blessed are ye, even when you cannot understand, but when you are able to obey God. So, uh, Isaiah 53 verse 7. And yet he opened not his mouth. That is talking about Jesus Christ, but it also talks about Isaac. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers, and is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. You know whether you are like Isaac or not. Whether you are like Jesus or not. When they sacrificed your reputation in your office and told a lie against you, didn't you so? You know you thought. When they sacrificed your money in your office and it didn't give to you because <clears throat> they said this or that, didn't you so? Of course, you quarrel. When they slapped you on the right cheek and they ill treated you and your boss was uh, doing to you like you would not do to other people. Well, if I don't talk, they will think that I am dead. They will misunderstand my Christian testimony. I will talk. You talk. But the measure in which you talk made you to fail yourself. And you are not like Isaac and like Jesus Christ. And we are to follow after the footsteps of Jesus Christ. How have you been reacting to your testing time during persecution? Didn't you talk? Why aren't you shouting on your father, on your mother, on some other people? Why aren't you annoyed? When Christians also, in their own obedience to the word of God, it affected you. Then you said you went around to other people. Well, I've been looking at uh, that uh, Mr. Kumui. I didn't quarrel with him about his uh, strange idea. But look, he doesn't even consider other people. He said he was obeying God and his obedience to God. Look at what it has cost me now. I didn't know when the God was talking to me. And his strictness and this and this has now made me to lose faith. God didn't talk to Isaac. God was only talking to Abraham. And the obedience of Abraham was going to cost Isaac his very life. If it were you, you will know whether you would have behaved like Isaac or not. The testing of Abraham and of Isaac. The past said, now I know that to fear me. Now it was only then the Lord could trust and he could say, now I know that to fear and that to love. And it's when you sacrifice your all on the altar of God that God will be able to say, you have been saying that to love me, you have been singing that to love me. But now I know that you love me indeed. And we are told in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that brethren, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you give yourself, you give your body a living sacrifice unto God. For this is the only thing that is acceptable unto God. And this is your reasonable service. And we know that it is only when we give up everything unto God, like He demands, that we will be offering unto God a reasonable service. It's only then we'll be worshiping God in truth, in truth and in spirit. And today, the Lord is still asking you, like He asked Abraham, and is asking son or daughter, give this unto me. Give your whole heart, give your whole life, everything unto me. Remember, you have your testing time. And the Lord will not announce when he's testing you. 
but you're keeping true to every sin, every minute sin, every day of your life will make you to pass and to get through into victory every time the Lord is testing you. And that will provide for you a crown that fades not away in heaven when the Lord will rapture us all. Shall we? The Lord has tried your patience. And you know by now whether you have passed or you are willing to tell the Lord, Lord, I didn't know that was my testing time. Now I give myself to you. He tried your deadness to the world. He wanted to see whether there was no more worldliness. Have you passed his trial and his test? You can tell the Lord, I didn't know it was my test this time, but now, Lord, I understand that. And you know that true worship means giving up your heart, your life, everything you want to go. Nobody ever knocked any good thing by so 
surrendering to God. Abraham did not choose. God gave him back his Isaac and gave him back wonderful blessings. The God passed, God said. If a God who gave God, who used the blessing, who used the grass, who used heaven, who used the salvation. For those who depend on God, Thank <laughs> you. 